beautiful Bangalore city and we are standing in ISKCON temple. Today we have with us Chanchala Pati Das, an engineer turned Krishna devotee, senior vice president of ISKCON Bangalore and also vice chairman of Akshay Patra, the foundation that runs the government's largest midday meal program in public schools. Welcome to Reason, the New Indians platform where we get to the reason behind the issues that concern you. Welcome, Mr. Dasa. Namaste. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to begin this conversation with the most obvious thing that would occur to anybody. An engineer turned Krishna devotee. How did that happen? You know, when I was in college, I was very fascinated by science. And so I would read a lot of books on science. And uh, one thing that intrigued me when I read science, science is about nature, right? What is holding the earth and the moon and what's causing the movement. But then in science, we study that there are forces which are precisely defined by mathematical equations, like mass, product of the masses and the inverse square of the distance. You know, all these kind of things. These things fascinated me. How nature is governed by laws which are expressed in mathematical equations. You're saying there's a design. There's an intelligent design. I see that there is an intelligent design and I'm aware very much of the science and this group of scientists, not everybody, uh, who try to explain design without a designer. But then, uh, you know, when I studied these things and from both sides of the argument, I was uh, very strongly influenced to see that there is a, a designer. Yeah. And uh, the next thing is, if there is a design and there's a designer, what is the intent of the designer? Is there an intent? Is there an intent? It, it must be. If there is a designer, anything we do has an intent. Even a common people like us, you, are, you have come to Bangalore, you had an intent. Yes. Anybody who stop a car in the, on the street and ask, sir, where are you going? What's your purpose? He or she will tell you oh, there is some intent. So you're saying so, that this creator has an intent and all the good things, the bad things, the beautiful things are happening because there is an intent. There is an intent. It's just not me who is saying. One of the renowned scientists who just passed away some time back, Stephen Hawking. He says, he was working on a problem called the theory of everything. Mm -hmm. It's actually a problem, even when I was in high school, I used to hear about it. It had a different name called the grand unification theory. Scientists had found out that there are four fundamental forces and uh, they have been thinking, why four? Can we reduce this to one by a grand unification of the four forces? And these are some of the cutting edge science research that's going on. And Stephen Hawking was working on one of one, on these kind of subjects. And he made a statement. If there is a theory of everything, and it should be a simple theory expressible, you know, not by some complex mathematics, only a few scientists can understand. Even common people will be able to sit around a table and discuss this. It should be so simple and elegant that common people can sit around a table and discuss. And if we are able to do that, then we have, this is a greatest triumph of human intellect. And we would have understood why the universe exists and why we exist. And we would have known the mind of God. So we don't know really. We don't know the God's mind. We don't know what his intent is really because a lot of horrible things that happen in the world, whether it's an earthquake, we saw what happened in Turkey recently and Syria also. 
when you look at the misery of the world, when you look at people suffering for food, people dying of starvation, what is the intent of God? You know, on the one hand, science is looking at all these kind of very complex things and trying to find an explanation about world, universe, and how it is governed and intent, all of that. This is what I was fascinated as a college student. Later on, by some strange coincidences, I came in touch with Indian philosophy, and then I came in touch with Srila Prabhupada's writings. Uh, Srila Prabhupada is the founder of ISKCON. Yes. And I read his books, and I began to read and understand that what was striking was these very questions about the ultimate cause, the intent of the, cause, of the creation, intent of all our being here, these were the subjects dealt in the Vedic literatures in a very profound way. So science has one kind of a methodology, and the Vedic literatures have another kind of a methodology to approach the same problem, yes. to answer these important questions about the universe. So you are in search of all these answers still, are you? Ah, so in the, uh, you know, this is the whole thing. Some people like to be professional searchers all their life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in the Vedic uh, paradigm, in the Vedic perspective, you are told that this is the answer, this is the thing. And then there is an internal process where you work on yourself and get to understand, appreciate, realize, perceive, and experience that ultimate cause and the ultimate understanding. So it's not just that I'm, I'm still searching, searching. No, the Vedic literatures are pointing out, this is the cause, this is the reason. And now for you to understand, you have to build certain internal qualifications mm -hmm. and how we can work on that so that we will be able to perceive. So it's according to the, there's a statement in the Bhagavad Gita. As you prepare yourself, you begin to understand and appreciate that ultimate reality. So it's in our hands. This is the path. This is the way you should do. And that's the solution. And now you have to tread and make that journey for your own internal experience and perception. Today, the newer generations, the younger generations, they are on a different trajectory altogether. They are moving away from the spiritual path. Is it very difficult to persuade the younger gen generations? And for Krishna consciousness, for the kind of work ISKCON does, how difficult, challenging it is to reach out to the younger generation? I would see, the, see it the other way. I see the younger generation today are more open, are more inquisitive, and they are looking for some of these, you know, more deeper things than the younger generation was in my time. Oh. I would see it that way because you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there was, uh, you know, India was not like the way it is today. The challenge that we are having is how to communicate and reach out this very wonderful information that we have in the Vedic culture to these young people. And if we don't provide that, quickly and in an interesting and in a compelling and a persuasive manner, they get exposed to other kinds of uh, issues and other kinds of inputs in the world and they may drift away. But the openness, their preparedness to know, I see there is a lot of it. Not only India, I would say. Across the world? Across the world, there are people genuinely seeking trying to know what is this and it's a, f a sad thing that not so many people you know uh, our our field religion 
spirituality, philosophy sometimes. Unfortunately, there have been people who have misled and uh, their own personal character and things were not very, their conduct was not very morally upright and ethical. As a result, there is a certain amount of skepticism. What would you say that, uh, say to, to somebody uh, like me, if I were younger, uh, who would look at religion from that prism, that they are also doing what others are doing, the marketing. They are into marketing God. <laughs> Interesting. So, yes, if you look, study ISKCON, you may find some of those elements which are present. Uh, yes, we do that. And uh, there is a philosophical reason for that. Because mm -hmm. we have an intent to take this knowledge and message to more and more people and present it. While we do that, so although externally big temples and all the glitter you may see, our Acharya Prabhupada taught us that deep inside we must be utterly simple and our lifestyle, life practices should be very simple. So. I'll give you an example. We have two restaurants. The higher taste is a higher. It's a fine dine restaurant. We have a rule in our temple. None of us go and eat there. I get guests like you and I may take you there and I'll maybe sip a glass of water because that rich, nice ambience and the food is meant for guests so that they come to eat prasadam. It is Krishna prasadam that is served. But we go back to the ashram and eat simple roti and sabji and dal. So, so the practitioners of the philosophy that you preach and propagate, you're basically, you live a frugal life. We lead a simple, frugal life. Prabhupada paraphrased it this way. Simple life and high thinking. It shouldn't be simple thinking and high lifestyle. <laughs> Okay, coming to the other allegation or accusation that a lot of religious institutions face nowadays. In fact, we are in the midst of a controversy with respect to the Lai Lama. Uh, religious institutions are now, a lot of people are projecting them as these, you know, dens of abuse where children are getting abused. When an institution is there and you are you have made it into a big institution, it's likely that there will be some elements, some people who may not be able to come up to that standard. So on the one hand, internally, even in ISKCON, we have an internal cleansing process. And whenever we come across any such thing, we have a way to deal with it. We chant the mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And the principle is that this chanting of the holy names of Krishna, what it does is cheto darpana marjanam. It is to cleanse. Marjanam means to cleanse. Cheta is chitta, chetana. Chetana marjanam. It is cleansing the consciousness. Because once all these abusive things that you mention happen because the consciousness is not clean. A doctor is trained to look for symptoms and conclude and diagnose what is the ailment. In the same way we are trained in this, that we can make out that uh, someone has a clean, cleaned, con clean consciousness or a pure consciousness or it's a polluted consciousness. And the, it's the polluted consciousness that results in all of those abusive, negative, um, you know, things that you are mentioning. An institution like ISKCON, how are you able to deal with the criticism that Hindu society is facing? You, on the other hand, are at the forefront of raising awareness about Hinduism, raising awareness about Krishna consciousness. How are you dealing? What is the way ahead for institutions like ISKCON with the rise in Hindu phobia? You see, obviously we know it's, uh, you know, Hinduism and uh, 
our Vedic philosophy is, uh, you know, is about peace, internal tranquility and external peace. And, and uh, there's no, it's, it's not as religion that spreads hatred at all. It's misinformation. So I would think that, and even that, uh, someone goes crazy and, uh, you know, attacks Hindus. And, and I would think we have to set right proper information, correct in dissemination of information, and uh, reach out to people and make them understand at least the basics of our Hindu philosophy. Be because, you know, like for instance, Gandhi, he would read Bhagavad Gita and he would always consult Bhagavad Gita and he was, he stood for non-violence. We see a lot of literature coming in Western media calling India a fascistic country nowadays under uh, the present dispensation. We also see a lot of social media negativity against India. Isn't isn't it more difficult for institutions like ISKCON, uh, given the fact that you are at the forefront of... Actually, uh, it is, you know, although, yes, I agree that I have come across and have seen those kind of misinformation about Hinduism and about our country, about our leadership, all such things may be there. There is also, I would think, more thoughtful, intelligent people around the world who are appreciating this. And especially the common people, when we interact with people and they are so respectful. Why go abroad, go to America? Here in our temple, a lot of Westerners come. And uh, we have an arrangement for Westerners if they want a guided tour, we provide. And I get to interact, not too many, but at least some, there's a team of devotees who interact with them. But I, I know what kind of feedback we get. They are all very sensitive, very careful, very happy, very welcoming to understand these things about our culture. And uh, yes, there is misinformation and that is spreading. And there is an there is a organized effort to spread that. That's all true, I agree. So we have to step up our organization to provide the correct information and to provide such to step up and to intensify our dissemination, you need an organized effort. Now, if you look at uh, the foundation of ISKCON International, it was set up by Swami Prabhupada yes. in New York. Yes. And uh, we do see that ISKCON, at least in America, I lived in the US, uh, ISKCON International is not able to draw as many Westerners or as many foreigners now as it used to earlier. What is the reason? And uh, what are the measures that you are taking to spread or propagate the Krishna philosophy? Uh, <clears throat> yes and no. Okay. You know, Srila Prabhupada in the 1970s, he passed away in 1977. So Srila Prabhupada brought out, a, created this movement and uh, thousands of Westerners were attracted. Very sadly, there were some internal problems within ISKCON. We are trying to overcome that. As a result, uh, at, some, at the leadership, there were some issues and there have been serious setbacks, especially in America. Mm -hmm. But we are doing well in other, other parts of the world. Uh, like in Europe, especially Eastern Europe, we are doing very well. And in India, you know, Srila Prabhupada had about 5,000 initiated disciples. And uh, initiated means very strict. You know, it's not just lay persons. Like Prabhupada had four principles to follow that we all follow. We don't take any intoxicants. Mm -hmm. No smoking, no alcohol, mm -hmm. no coffee and tea. Yeah. No meat eating, mm -hmm. no onion, no garlic. Mm -hmm no gambling, mm -hmm. and no illicit connection with women. Yes. And in addition, I was telling you in the morning, rise early in the morning, do this japa, and then every day we have a class for about an hour mm. uh, on, the, on the Bhagavatam. So 
uh, for somebody to do all these things, it's not so easy. Imagine a Westerner yeah. uh, who has to give up all these yes. kind of things. It's yeah. easier probably for Indians, but uh, at least. So and Prabhupada had 5,000. Out of the 5,000 disciples, I don't think there were more than 100 Indians. Wow. So it was like that. Prabhupada's success was largely outside of that, the country. That actually is a very insightful thing that you said. Do you feel that the West has uh, drifted away from, from that, that thought process which it had during uh, Swami Prabhupada's time? Now we see a lot of Westerners going to shrinks. Everybody uh, in at least uh, in the US would have at least gone to a psychiatrist once in their lifetime. Uh, Do you think that West has has gone astray? Because you are telling me that 4,000 uh, 4, or more than 4,000 followers of Swami Prabhupada, Prabhupada. were Westerners. Yeah. What has happened in the West? You see, in the 70s, there was a lot of economic affluence. There was technology and uh, there was no spiritual bearing. As a result, people went astray and uh, there was materialism. And when you have that kind of a materialism, that's not going to make us happy because deep inside we are spiritual beings. You take a fish out of water and you may put that fish in an air conditioned room and turn on the best uh, air con audio system and provide music, the fish is going to be miserable. It has to be back in water. In the same thing, we are spiritual beings. This is nothing to do with Hinduism or thisism or Indians. Or this, what the Vedic literature is teaching, it's very universal. Inside every human being, there is a spirit. Not just human beings, even an animal, a dog, cat, a bird. There is a spirit and that spirit is currently in a material atmosphere. And so we are wriggling. We are struggling like a fish out of water. Now that's, the spirit has to be put back into a spiritual atmosphere. And then that's natural for the spirit. And India was in a relatively, you know, poorer kind of a situation and Prabhupada didn't get a good response in India. He tried for about 40 years. When Prabhupada went to America, he was 70 years old and he was trying to spread this knowledge from 1936 onwards. For nearly 35 years he had tried. He tried to build an institution, he tried to get followers, he tried to create publication. In every way, he had failed. Religions are so diverse. The religious traditions, customs, there are so many that uh, people actually don't like to get organized around one center or one religious center. In the Vedic literatures, it looks like there are myriad con con few conclusions and conflicting, contradicting conclusions. It doesn't look like it's coherent. Is it really incoherent and full of varieties of unresolved things? It's actually not so. There is a resolution. There is a coherent, cogent message. Not many people know about it. So, Srila Prabhupada belonged to a tradition where these things were carefully, sensitively, accurately addressed. And uh, uh, you, you may think that, oh, you belong to ISKCON and so you're glorifying, you know, you're, everything is great. No, I'm, I was on the other side of the table for many years and I was hearing. And even after I jumped into ISKCON, I never gave up my objectivity. And I kept internally questioning, understanding why Prabhupada says this and what other organizations and other spiritual organizations, what do they say and how do we reconcile? So I have, you know, to a certain extent, it's about 40 years that I'm in ISKCON now. So this kind of an internal questioning and churning has been happening. And uh, so I have found that uh, there is a way to reason this, but not everybody would have 
put their you know mind and intelligence and attention to all of these things in the vedic culture there are different traditions different methods to address people at different levels of spiritual evolution so that they can take a few steps forward so suppose there is somebody in step 4 and in his life he practices certain things that are given in the vedic literatures and he moves from step 4 to step 8 that's progress so this spiritual evolution is a multi life process a soul gradually evolves and come to the hundredth step which is spiritual blossoming with so much materialism around yeah with now artificial intelligence taking over with so much money in the hands of young people you don't have to really strive how do you think people will understand what you are saying why will people get drawn towards the message that you are actually uh, putting out here in the bhagavad gita especially krishna says that yes there are myriad paths to take people along this spirituality but don't take this step 1 step 2 step 50 step 60 70 and so on multi life he he provides an alternative he says don't grow up the steps go look for an elevator take the elevator get into the elevator press button 100 straight it takes you mm-hmm. and you, and this elevator can operate from any level whichever level one is in get into the elevator and go to the hundreds so we can do that very quickly so this kind of a resolution exists that it is not confusing contradicting incoherent this wonderful message we are not able to quickly present it to the seekers and get them to appreciate and understand and benefit from that so i feel in spite of technology social media economic affluence in india or anywhere in the world people truly are looking for spirituality deep inside because they know that all all the things that materialism can provide does not satisfy what is the difference between what indian spiritual institutions are doing and what let's say the church is doing what islam is doing what other religions are doing in the world if you take any religion in the world the core of the religion is how to love god how to decrease materialism how to increase spirituality in oneself and that spirituality spiritual quotient going up in an individual should result in a better human being who respects other human beings who respects all of god's creation not just human beings other living entities and nature itself not go around abusive the way we have messed up with our world this is not what every religion in the core teaches love of god and because these religions were taught in a different time scales during different times in the history of humanity and in different geographies in different cultural settings that principle of love of god was taught in a way that those people could understand but the core is the same including hinduism uh, coming down to this fundamental question which nowadays is in uh, being debated everywhere that artificial intelligence can create consciousness is that mm. possible do you think science and religion which though are seeking uh, the same answers for the same question science can build and science can create consciousness there is one uh, nobel prize winning scientist i think he passed away some years ago he said we wanted to study life he he got his nobel prize in medicine mm-hmm. we wanted to study life and uh, when we studied life and living systems we finally came across molecules atoms molecules and those interactions and somewhere down the line life and consciousness slipped away f- 
from our fingers, between our fingers. You know, something like that artificial. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> there are scientists who acknowledge there is a certain spiritual reality about consciousness and such things, and science is not any way near that. I heard just about a few years back, three, four years back, from another Nobel Prize winning scientist in India, in Bangalore, who was visiting. He said that there are so many things that we don't understand about consciousness, about living systems. Many scientists admit that there is a spiritual reality and we must understand that. And maybe the methods of science are not the methods that are equipped to unravel these spiritual realities. We must have probably alternate methodology. And that's what Vedic literature say. You need another approach to understand and appreciate spirit. So what does Prabhupada say about consciousness? What exactly is Krishna consciousness? What is consciousness according to Vedanta? You see, consciousness in a very fundamental, simple way is awareness, right? You are aware, we are aware. Even if there is a dog, the dog is aware. But there are other things in around us, like there are buildings, there is furniture, there is no aware, there is no consciousness, that's matters. Sentient and insentient hmm. reality, we all notice that. So that consciousness is a spark of consciousness, is the one which is aware of the body, the mind, the thoughts going on in the mind, the intelligence functioning. We are aware of all this. And Krishna says that if you carefully study our body, our own lives, we see that the body is changing, our mind is changing, intelligence is improving, but the awareness of all this is the constant person. You are the vice chairman of Akshay Patra, the foundation that runs the largest midday meal uh, in public schools of India. That is a phenomenal exercise with millions of children getting food. How do you do that? How? Has this happened? You know, we always say <clears throat> Akshaya Patra is a story of a convergence of spirituality and material organization and institution and use of technology and all of those things. At the heart of it, there is a spirituality in it, meaning that giving food is God's work. God is the one who maintains everyone. And we are playing a small, humble part to reach that food to a hungry child. So we have to ensure that the child gets food and it should be safe, clean, nutritious, and it should be delightful experience because that's God's intention. He wants to, he's the provider for every human, not just human beings, even animals. Who is providing food to all the innumerable fishes in the depths of the ocean? They all have their own kind of a digestive system. They all have a predefined kind of a food. They have to eat that food which gets digested in their little bodies and provides them energy. This is so complex organization and God is the one who is providing food to everyone. And so, our Acharya Prabhupada, he wanted this from his gone temples. We should see that no one goes hungry in a 10 mile radius of a temple. And we took that, that, uh, you know, that message that Prabhupada, the direction that Prabhupada had given. And we are in fact working with the government. You know, we, it's a partnership with the government. Indian government have, runs the biggest school meal program in the world. Yes. So we are working with the government and uh, so government provides some support, some certain amount of cost and land in some places and some uh, uh, to build the kitchen facilities and resources. And we also go to thousands of donors. We raise money and that's how we uh, run this operation. And so, as I said, we use technology, we use good management practices, we, we bring people together and at the same time, at the core of it, 
It is spirituality that we can't let a child go hungry. We can't get a let a child go uneducated and distracted from education because of hunger. And we have to get, especially this is relevant in our country, and we have to see that children are well-fed, well-educated. And if we have to do that on a big scale, you need organization. You need good management practices. That's why we say that Akshay Patra is a beautiful convergence of technology, management, good practices, and spirituality, which brings compassion. And to, we should do our duty and our dedication and our commitment to duty and for the well-being of humanity. So these are some of the things. Thank you so much for this enlightening conversation. Hare Krishna. Namaste. Hare Krishna.